ability to really uh, discover new medicines today, discover new perfumes today, cosmetics, um, insecticides and pesticides, uh, materials that become plastics, uh, colorful things that go into your fashion goods like clothes and other things. So these are all the, the goods that come out of organic synthesis. And today it is practice uh, in academia. Uh, the job of the academics are academicians and the students is to advance the art and science of organic synthesis to higher levels of molecular complexity and diversity and also show how these advances can be applied by the industry like pharmaceutical industry to make new medicines for people for example and there is a lot of collaboration between synthetic chemists biologists and pharmaceutical companies as well today and the research in universities and institutes like this one goes from all the way over the fundamentals of the science to the applied research continuum. Um, we try to make more and more complex compounds because by doing that we can really make new things that um, can really change our world for the better, whether we're talking about the environment, whether we're talking about um, eliminating hunger or eliminating disease um, or protecting the environment, as I said. Um, these are solutions that can be provided by synthetic organic chemists. So uh, just to show you the, the short history of organic synthesis, by the way, it was invented through an accident when a scientist in Germany uh, was doing an experiment in the laboratory and uh, suddenly he realized that he converted uh, an inorganic substance, these are the types of things you find in rocks, into a substance produced by a living creature like us. Uh, called urea. That, that milestone happened in 1828 right here in Germany and it marked the beginning of organic synthesis. The red band is the, is the evolution, the emergence and the evolution of organic synthesis throughout the 19th century, the 20th century and now in the 21st century. Out of this uh, fundamental discovery and the practice of organic synthesis emerged entire industries. The first one to emerge was the dye industry that you see here. Um, where a scientist can actually uh, they discover indigo, they synthesize indigo. Indigo is a, it's identified with the, with the name of India as well. It comes out of, of the natural world, of nature. But scientists were able to reproduce that, replicate it in the laboratory, and then they built the factories to make indigo by the ton in a more efficient and economical way than harvesting that from nature. And that became basically the beginning of the dye industry, which continues to evolve today with new colors, uh, all kinds of flashy things that you see on T-shirts and, and other good items and displays and so on and so forth. So the dye industry was born as a consequence of, of synthetic organic chemistry. Another industry that was of paramount importance today to us is the pharmaceutical industry, the science of discovering and developing new drugs. And that... Um, uh, happened um, in the late 19th century with the emergence of aspirin that we all know today. Aspirin came um, out of um, a discovery that happened a little bit earlier than that, and I will tell you a little bit about the story a little bit later. Uh, but things of that type, you can see, and then the emergence of biotechnology was based on things that synthetic chemists were able to make, like peptides, oligonucleotides, the pieces of the DNA, and so on. Um, and then, of course, we have material science today, nanotechnology. They all depend on synthetic organic chemistry to make their materials that they work with. Um, the genomics, uh, modern drug discovery and development, and so on, and synthetic biology. And today, as I mentioned to you before already, the global problems that we have as defined by the United Nations include nutrition, healthcare, and the environment. These are problems that can be addressed in collaboration with the other sciences I mentioned, like biology, uh, environmentalists, um, and the material scientists, uh, they can all be addressed through the, the central science of organic synthesis. So the importance of it is undeniable, and it provides, of course, very important um, careers for young people today. So if you haven't decided about what you want to do, if you're a beginner at college, then this is your time to pay attention and see if you uh, like this science and you want to follow it in your career but uh, the, the best advice I give to young students is actually a little bit more elaborate than that I urge them to identify their talents you have to know yourself 
and then you follow your talent with passion and discipline and hard work and that will give you confidence and that will give you success and eventually happiness and that's what will happen to me basically and I can I can retire from the passion that I brought me into this field because I don't know what to do with myself if I do retire so um, so anyway, we have a book out, which is called Molecules That Change the World, and I'm going to show you a few chapters from that book to really try and convince you the impact of the science of organic synthesis to society today. So you will see in this book, I wrote with one of my students, postdoctoral fellows, um, it begins with, the, the, this is a book you can buy for your grandparents, basically. You can, they can read and understand what you're doing if you're a chemist and appreciate why you're doing it. So we started with, with the Democritus, as I mentioned, the atomic theory of matter in ancient Greece, 2,500 years ago, when he decided that that was basically, if, if you take any item made out of matter and keep dividing it to small pieces, you, his conclusion was that you reach a very small, tiny uh, piece of that that you cannot divide anymore. Because if you can divide it to zero, then if you go the reverse, you cannot have anything. So that was his theory, and that was proven in the uh, beginning of the 19th century by John Dalton and the rest of course is history. The first organic substance to be made in the laboratory was urea. That's the one that's shown right there at the top. And then the second one was probably acetic acid which has a carbon, carbon bond in it. So very simple molecules that were made by early synthetic chemists in the 19th century. The, sec the second chapter that uh, I want to show you is the discovery of aspirin. How did the aspirin was the first the first medicine to be put in a tablet uh, that was in the pure form. Before that, we had recipes, extras from herbs, and things like that, that people that were not very pure. But aspirin was the first, and it was approved for, for use by people in 1999, more than a century ago, and it's still the most uh, popular medication we have. Um, it's an incredible small molecule, um, and the clue that um, was given to people was actually um, folk medicine. People knew from ancient times that if they can uh, extract a special tree, you can see here at the back, this is a willow tree that was used by ancient Egyptians 5,000 years ago to treat pain and fever. And they would take the bark of this tree and they chew it sometimes, and then from there they will sense the relief of pain. And also, if they had fever, the fever would go away. Now, that became um, like, and, the, and the, it was written in some ancient writings from Egypt from that time that these recipes were available to people. That uh, Hippocrates, which was a Greek doctor uh, 2,500 years ago, is, a, is considered to be the father of modern medicine. And every doctor today, I think, takes the Hippocratian oath before he becomes a practitioner of, of, of medicine. So he was. Um, recommending women, for example, to chew the willow bark during when they were giving birth to babies because to relieve all that, that pain that comes with the birth of a baby. And so this was all in the literature, and nobody knew, of course, what was the, the active ingredient in the, the willow bark until chemistry became of age, and scientists became um, interested in isolating the active ingredient from that tree. And they found it, and it was a rather complex natural product, like here, and that was called salicin. Then chemists went further and started degrading that molecule into smaller pieces, testing it, and they found that a small fragment of it that looks like, like this one that's in the box um, had this even a better effect than the natural product. And that was because of their ability to convert one substance to another in the laboratory through synthesis. And that became a paradigm for discovering new medications for people. So that's the story of aspirin, basically. And um, today we know how aspirin works, thanks to uh, inventions and discoveries in biology. And uh, people won the Nobel Prize for that. And you can see that the three people here shared the Nobel Prize in 1982 for medicine, um, for discovering how aspirin works. Uh, people like E.J. Corey, who also won the Nobel Prize in 1990, were interested in making some of these molecules involved in this um, bio biology and biochemistry of the prostaglandins and the 
uh, other related compounds that have to do with the action of aspirin. So um, now I'm going to tell you about another magic molecule, like penicillin. So if aspirin came or it was inspired from the forest, penicillin was, um, came from the uh, from soil, we would say. That's where we, we find microbes, bacteria, fungi, that really wage war against each other. There's a chemical warfare going on um, in, in the ground, in, in, the, in the soil, because um, bacteria fight for food. They fight for territory. So they secrete certain types of uh, chemicals, molecules that kill other bacteria or fungi and so on. So it was from here that Fleming discovered penicillin from these microbes. And the legend goes that he, um, he discovered this at um, uh, Oxford University in England. Um, and he, he was a microbiologist. So he had petri dishes like this one. And um, one day he, w he left the petri dish there with bacteria growing in it and went for a vacation apparently. He left the window open and um, some other microbes came in and sat in that petri dish. And then when he came back and looked at it, he saw this picture you see here. And he found th this was actually a mold, a, fun a fungus, type of a fungus that sat there. And he looked like this at the bacteria here. And he noticed that there were no bacteria around the fungus growing. So he suspected that the that fungus was producing some chemical that was killing the bacteria. And he went fishing. He solicited the help of some uh, real chemist that isolated eventually. And the structure was elucidated through X-ray crystallography of the structure of penicillin. You can see one of them right here. Now, penicillin um, was a scarce molecule. They couldn't produce enough of it. And so. From 1928 until the break of the Second World War, penicillin had not been developed into an antibiotic. But the outbreak of the Second World War gave incentive to um, the Allied forces, the British mainly and the Americans, to find a way to develop penicillin. And they found, uh, through um, the search, they found basically another, um, another um, source. They found another variation of the fungus that produced penicillin in the original uh, time, they found one in a, in, a, in a multi cantaloupe like this one um, that produced penicillin in large amounts. And by the time the Allied forces, you can see Eisenhower and Montgomery here, crossed the channel into France against the, the Germans, they carried with them three million doses of penicillin that was by that time developed as a drug. And because the soldiers were dying in the battlefield, um, because they were not from um, basically uh, fungi, uh, the infections rather than bullets. So this uh, discovery saved many lives and continues to save many lives today. Basically, it is, uh, penicillin is credited for almost doubling the longevity of um, in developed countries at least uh, after World War II because we had a weapon against infections that was killing people and we had plagues and so on and so forth. So that is, and today chemists can make these things in the laboratory. They can make improvements because bacteria continuously develop resistance to all the antibiotics we have. It is true that with all our weapons, including nuclear weapons, we cannot eradicate bacteria from the earth. And even if we could, it would be a big mistake because we need them we symbiotically to live with them. And so we still have to be um, vigilant and produce new antibiotics against the drug resistant strains that develop all the time. So that's another story of another molecule that came out of a rock. This rock was picked up by a scientist from a pharmaceutical company in the United States from a highway in Texas. Um, he picked it up, very unusual stone, and took it to the laboratory with the intention of growing um, microbes that may be living in this rock. These people are a little uh, strange. When they go on holidays, they're dedicated in, in any strange places in the world. They collect mud from the banks of rivers uh, or from uh, trees or from the bottom of the ocean or from rocks. And then in this instance, the, the people were very, the scientists were very lucky because they found this molecule that has a beautiful molecular structure. It's probably the most beautiful natural product I ever seen. 
And when I first looked at it, I was totally stunned. Um, I did not believe these people. Uh, they called me up to go and visit them. And I said to them, well, um, when I have time, when I'm in New York, I'll let you know. They said, you don't understand. We want you to come soon because we have something important to show you. So I drove at the time I was at the uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And I said, well, but I don't have the time now. So what do you have to show me? He said, we have a compound that has phenomenal activity of, against cancer. And the structure, we are sure you're going to be interested in this structure. So I said, okay, I'm coming tomorrow. So I got into my car. I drove two hours to go there. As soon as I walked in the door, uh, one of them was waiting for me with a piece of paper. He gave it to me and said, sign this confidentiality agreement. So I took it, I put it against the wall. They gave me a pen and I signed it. And he rushed me upstairs in a small room, dark room, put the lights on. And there were three scientists. They got a piece of paper and they showed me the structure. And when I saw it, um, I lost my speech. I couldn't say anything for five minutes. And then um, after I, five minutes, I raised my head up and looked at them and I said, you must be crazy. This thing cannot exist. It's very unusual and, and it's not going to be able to accommodate two acetylenes and a double bond in this brain region of the molecule. So in the end, they convinced me that it was true. I went home and I got my group together the same evening and I told them we're going to work on this secret project. It's called Molecular Robotics and you're not supposed to say anything because the company, I, I had signed something. I couldn't release the structure until they published it. So I applied for money and I was turned down. The reviewer said you have the wrong structure. Apparently one of the sugars was attached at the wrong hydroxy group on this molecule here. So they, they refused to give me the money. Uh, probably the company gave me the wrong structure intentionally because they didn't trust me to give me the right one. But anyway, we made the molecule anyway, the first group, in five years. It took us five years to make this molecule. So now I'm going to speed up a little bit. It's, it's got a beautiful mechanism of action. Those experts will know. Um, and in fact, I, I worked for my PhD for this gentleman right here, who was perhaps the first one to observe Franz Zonheimer is his name. First one to observe the mechanism of action of how this molecule works. It's magical radical chemistry. The, the way this molecule works, it binds into the minor groove of the genetic, genetic material. It explodes, generating radicals, which abstract hydrogen atoms from the DNA and cause cuts, double-strand cuts of the DNA killed in the cancer cell. Unfortunately, it's not selective, and therefore by itself, is not a suitable medicine. But I'll show you at the end how this will turn down into a medicine later on. So this is the group of my group that made this compound. It took five years, as I told you, for these guys working in the, in the lab. But in the end, it was really rewarding. So here's how they made it into a drug. They attached it. Uh, these are the people from the company, by the way, that uh, gave me the, the structure. They put it on an antibody, which can recognize cancer cells through a chemical linker. And then this becomes like a laser-guided missile that delivers a bomb, which is this molecule that explodes and kills the DNA of the cell selectively. And so it was approved uh, later on as a medicine, but then it was withdrawn because it was found to have some side effects because the linker was actually very weak, releasing the molecule in the bloodstream before it reaches its target. And now chemists made more robust linkers, and now some of this, the drugs are in, in, in clinical trials to be developed again. So that's the story of calichomycin. Taxol is another very, very important uh, molecule. This is the most widespread uh, drug against cancer today. It's not a cure for cancer, but it helps a lot of people, especially for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and other things that um, it can be used in combination or by itself. Um, so it comes again, from, it came from the forest. And um, there was a clue there from a book that Julius Caesar wrote uh, 2,000 years ago. Uh, when uh, he defeated some um, um, uh, barbarians, as he called them, from the north at the time, uh, and that, that their leader committed suicide by making tea out of a tree that called the European yew tree. It's shown right here, a beautiful tree with some berries on it. So that was a clue to scientists. So maybe they followed this up. And in the 1970s, they discovered it in, a, in one of these uh, very uh, big trees 
in the um, western part of the United States, northwest, and one of these trees can produce uh, maybe a few hundred milligrams of taxol, very scarce molecule. So taxol was developed eventually, it was developed into a drug, um, and uh, unfortunately there was a problem of um, a supply for it, because you needed to cut hundreds and hundreds of trees to treat just a simple, a single patient. That was not enough, of course. So a lot of groups around the world started working on the photosynthesis of this molecule. There were at least 10 that began in the, in, from the beginning of the 1970s until the, 19, the early 90s, when we moved to the scriptures and instituted ourselves, and we began to work on this molecule in, in 1991, 1992, when I got my first three students from there, that institution. So we worked on that, and there was a big competition. It was in the media. Uh, the, the, the environmentalists were screaming that they didn't want anyone to cut the trees because in the, in the trees were living special birds like the spotted owl, and they didn't want to extinct that and so on. On the other hand, patients were dying, and they were needed the medicine. So synthetic chemistry came uh, to the rescue of this, so to speak. And uh, the first synthesis was published from our laboratories in 1994. And it was an incredible uh, um, campaign by my 10 students. I began with three students, um, and uh, I ended up with 10 at the end of that. Most of these guys are now professors around the world, very successful people. Um, and they were worrying at the end because the, some other uh, group leaders from other labs were claiming they're going to make this by Christmas and, and this and that, and they came to me saying, well, what are we trying for? We, we started, it was the last group to start. These people have been working for 10 years on this molecule. What, what makes you think we're going to make this first? Well, I said, it doesn't matter if you make it first or not. You're doing science here. You discover something important, and don't worry about what the others are saying. Just work hard in the lab, and, uh, because you can be so close, finishing a 12 synthesis, and yet so far. And sure enough, one night, one Friday night, I remember, uh, I, was, I went to bed at 11.30, and um, the phone rang. I didn't hear it, but my wife picked it up. She was in the kitchen, and came to find me and said, you somebody on the telephone uh, wants to talk to you. And of course, I just was very tired and I, I fall asleep and I said to her, well, I'm, I'm tired now, just uh, tell him to call me tomorrow. So she went away and then came back right away and said, he, he will not go away, he wants to talk to you. I said, who is it? She said, I don't know, it's somebody with a foreign accent, I don't know. Uh, so she pushed me to pick up the phone. So I picked up the phone and it was a member of my team, uh, it was Hiroagi actually. Um, Hiroagi is this guy here, who is now a big manager of a pharmaceutical company in, in Japan. And he said, I said, what, why, what are you calling me now for? Um, we, got, we got something, come to the lab, he said. Come to the lab because we have to tell you something. Well, what is this? I said, come to the lab. Tell me first, what is it? Well, he said, we made Taxol. So I put the phone down, I put my jogging suit on, and in five minutes I was in the lab. We looked at the spectra, and by Monday, we dispatched the paper to Nature, and the rest is history. So these are the pleasures and the excitements of the business of making molecules, especially if they are important molecules. Um, so this is now how we go. Another group made the, the molecule as well, a, a little bit later from us. And then um, again, that's so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about modern things that go on in, in our group, OK? Um, we, we are good on time, I think. So, um, so I'm going to tell you about photosynthesis of targeted natural products. Also, in the practice of this business, you can elucidate the structures of molecules themselves that were wrongly assigned and lie in the literature, wrong. You can also develop new synthetic methods and strategies. You can also make design analogs of these molecules for biology and medicine, for screening to optimize the, 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 the properties of these compounds which may become medicines one day. And then, of course, you have a platform to educate and train young students in academia for, for jobs in academia or for industrial careers that involve uh, problem-solving skills, drug discovery, development, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'll show you some of the molecules we made in, in uh, my group. We usually pick up structures which show novelty that we have not seen before. And we proceeded from simple structures, as you can see, to more and more complex as we were 
getting, gaining confidence in ourselves to make more and more complex molecules in order to advance the science of organic synthesis. We also look for biological activity that's important in order to perhaps use our chemistry to discover drug candidates for further development. So you can see that's one slide. That's more chronologically now. You can see more and more compounds. Taxol is right here, and it looks relatively small compared to other compounds like uh, Brevetoxin B that we made, calichomycin is right here, uh, rapamycin and uh, amphotericin. These are all important drugs today, um, and so some of them are not. Maybe some of them are still in development, but uh, not everything, of course, gets up to, to, to be in the clinic. Then there's uh, more of them. Another important famous molecule here is uh, vancomycin, which is the last line of defense of humanity against bacteria, as you may know. Uh, but even bacteria develop resistance against this drug as well. So we have to be vigilant. The last three rows that you see here are things that, uh, no, we have still more, more, more than one, so you see here, and you have even more here. Um, the last ones here, I will tell you about the stories of a couple of these we made in the last three or four years at Rice University. And they're all anti-cancer agents or antibiotics, by the way. Uh, so I will show you very briefly we're in the process of making this compound, almost 200 natural products. Uh, we, we arrive at the final molecule to find out that it's not there. The structure that we were chasing was not the right structure because it was assigned the wrong structure by those who isolated the molecule to begin with. So you can see on these slides, the structures that were published are in red. And these were proven by us to be wrong because when we made this structure, the spectral data did not match with those published for the natural product. So we had to make more variations of the structure. You can see the blue ones. These are variations until we found the correct one, which is the one in green. The same and different structures here. This was not quite uh, correct. Uh, this was the correct structure. We made all these things here in order to find the two that were produced by the human body, basically. These are important biomolecules that have to do with our physiology and the, the people isolated trace, trace amounts for, from these molecules, so they couldn't tell the structures. We had to make all of them and then comparing the natural substance with all these, we determined that the correct ones were these two here in the box. So synthesis has a lot of role to play in biology. You can see more, more, more red molecules that were turning to green uh, on this slide here. Then again, more here, more here, you can see how many wrongs were, how many stereocenters and fractionalities were wrong. And then the most, this is the largest natural product ever discovered from nature, other than proteins and nucleic acids, of course. Now this is a huge molecule, it's called mitotoxin, and it happens to be the most powerful neurotoxin known, other than ricin, maybe, and a couple of other proteins. But the non proteonic is the most powerful one. And the structure of this compound was wrong here. It was challenged from the original. Now, we haven't made this molecule yet because we made big domains. We make, for example, this small domain here. We make this small domain here um, and that one, but we have not really put it all together yet. But we corrected this. We, we confirmed the structure here to be correct as shown here. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some other um, um, varieties of natural products that we have made, analogs, which some of them are simpler and yet they're more powerful than the natural products in order to improve their properties. So basically we made thousands and thousands of these analogs and in collaboration with biologists we determine their biology. You can see the values, you cannot see them, but we have, uh, you know, some of them are antibiotics, some of them are anti-cancer agents, some of them have other uh, enzyme inhibitors and all kinds of things discover so these are all products of the other science of organic synthesis, and there's a myriad of them with all the data to go with it. So here, just to tell you the, the progress we made on this molecule, the one I just showed you, we have made all the green pieces. Uh, we made all this big piece here that you see. We made this green piece, all the rings fused together in the rice field chemistry, by the way, and we made that one. What's missing is, to, is the funds, the money, to, to hire the young students that are going to go back and make all these big pieces, join them together, and fuse them to give the two missing rings. The two red ones are the ones missing. So it looks like very close, and yet it's, it's so far. Um, we made this small fragment, and we found it to be inhibitor of this molecule, and also uh, have some powerful anti-tumor activities as well. 
these are methodologies, methods that come across. Often when you come to a, a challenging um, junction in your synthesis, there is no tools available to, to overcome the obstacle. There's no reaction known. So you are forced to design a new reaction to solve your problem, which then may become available to other scientists who may want to discover drugs and use it. So you enrich the repertoire of uh, tools and methods of the art and science of organic synthesis. And so we have many of them here that you can, just a selection of them. I don't want to push you too much now, but it's just a lot. So now I'm just going to show you a couple of structures for the experts in the, in the audience, perhaps. And I'm not going to bore the others either, just to give you an idea. Of, of so we have a couple of antibiotics, natural products, and we have several anti-cancer agents, which we are working in collaboration with a biotechnology company to develop them into drugs, actually. And we have also drug candidates from this area as well. So here is one um, natural antibiotic that was uh, discovered not long ago. And the structure was given with like this. And when we, I saw, when we saw this structure, we said, be true. It doesn't look right. Uh, we thought instead that this would be a hydroxy ketone, like that one. Those chemists in the audience might appreciate this. So we targeted this one instead. But even if it was wrong, it would fall spontaneously to this structure. So this one is, is superior to tetracyclines and even vancomycin. You can see the activities of these molecules are very, very powerful. So that was an incentive to make them, and we did. So we used retrosynthetic analysis, which means is that you start with a complex target you want to make, and in your mind, you break it down to smaller fragments, and then you have to worry about putting the fragments together in the synthetic direction, the forward direction, to make the target. So by using your knowledge in synthetic chemistry and your imagination and creativity, you can break this down in an imaginary manner to these four fragments, one, two, three, four, and then through some chemistry, you are able now to make the missing rings in these spaces and come back to this one. So quickly, here's how you do it. You just make, you know, again, this is laboratory experiments now, right? And sometimes you can have explosions, as you heard last night. And an explosion actually, when I was a graduate student, I had an explosion. I had two, two, five liters of liquid ammonia, 200 grams of sodium blow into my face. And there was nobody there to help me in the lab. So for sure, and I was taken to the hospital, I was out for two weeks, and then during those two weeks, I was thinking of becoming a theoretician myself. This is what, <laughs> this is what Professor Shaver told you yesterday. And it's a true story for me. And thanks to my mentors who encouraged me, I went back to the lab, and now you see me standing in front of you as a synthetic organic chemist. So this is how you grow the molecule, basically, make it bigger and bigger with all the stereochemistry in place and X-ray structures to prove what you have in your hand, and in the end, you come all the way to the very end, and that's the final step. The chemists will realize that that's taking off all the protecting groups in the molecule, benzyl here, benzyl there, rupture this nitrogen-oxygen bond, and there comes in one step, in essentially conidated yield, the natural product. Of course, we made much more than the isolation chemists ever got, and we got crystals and we got an extra structure, and sure enough, this is the structure of the molecule not what they propose. So we corrected the structure. And we made simpler analogs that are missing some of these groups here, for example, like this one. This one is actually more, po more powerful, missing this hydroxy group, is more powerful than the natural product itself. This one and this one came out to be simpler and better. And one of them is actually undergoing in vivo studies with rats right now as we speak in India. So when I go to Hyderabad, I'm going to find out if this molecule is going to go further in the development or not. OK, so we developed an asymmetric synthesis of this as well. We just published it. There's another molecule that came out from the bottom of the ocean. Isolation chemists were able to isolate 300 micrograms of this compound ever. And that was it. They couldn't find the species again. So it, it, but it had very powerful antibiotic activities. Those who understand these numbers, they're phenomenal against bacteria. But looking at the structure, we thought it would also be an anti-cancer agent. So we started working with this. This goes through the mechanism of how it works. It kills DNA, by the way, just like calichomycin, but it's a little simpler. So in, in fact, this is the acetylenic bonds that are undergoing Bergman cyclization to give you an aromatic system. These are real colors. This beautiful color of these substances like that 
this uh, maroon and it turns into this after the satellites are disappearing and becoming a benzene ring and we have x-ray structures to prove that uh, we prove the stereochemistry and we prove the structure these are the fragments that we put together and we have now a very nice synthesis that we show that this molecule cleaves double-stranded DNA just like calichomycin you can see the bands very clearly here so we know that it can kill the genetic material and break it into pieces and so therefore we tested it and sure enough it's more powerful than Taxol more powerful than um, the epoxylons and so on you know the activity is really phenomenal you're talking about uh, 10 to the minus 11 molar which means picomolar for those who understand the term um, so this is another one from the bottom of the ocean isolated in tiny tiny amounts the activity of this molecule um, that you see at the bottom is a, is a relative of uh, calichomycin the, the, the head of the molecule right here which is the pharmacophore this is the action the, the bomb that blows up is the same exactly the same the tail which is the, the domain of the molecule that binds into the monocrew of DNA and delivers the, the warhead there uh, is different and yet this compound turned out to be more powerful than calichomycin itself so it was not made and uh, we had to make it and uh, um, here's what um, here's how calichomycin has this structure motif and so does this one and then a Bergman reaction means that the acetylenes come together to form a carbon carbon bond here leaving behind two radicals on the benzene ring each radical cuts one strand it's positioned to cut both strands simultaneously and by doing that the machinery of the cell cannot repair um, the damage anymore and it's a lethal blow to the cell so the molecule was again made retrosynthetically we decided to have a plan like this we have the small fragments and then the plan is like a road map you follow the road map you find many obstacles you have to take detours you have to come back redesign and try so it, you re it requires persistence originality imagination hard work discipline all those things are tested in the students who are doing this kind of work so it's very challenging and yet very rewarding at the end the skills are they gain skills become skillful how to solve problems and then they become fearful after that they can make any molecule they want so the molecule then grows as you can see in the lab step by step until you come towards more and more complex molecules you now finish in the molecule at the end you can put to you together the sugar part with this fractionality um, the glycoside takes place between this molecule here and this hydroxy group from this warhead you join them together with this bond and then you uh, attach from one sulfur you attach three two more you have three of them and at the end you deprotect it here and there and then you have your, your structure it's called she 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 myosin a first first time made in the lab a couple of years ago in our life there so we made uh, this is the testing against the cancer cells this is an analog that we made synthetically it has only two sulfurs here as opposed to three that has the natural product and this compound is, is turned out to be more powerful than this one simpler and yet more powerful you can see this is less than one picomolar that's a phenomenal activity for an anti-cancer drug then you will ask the question why do you make these poisons what use are they well by themselves they're useless but one can turn them into powerful medications I will show you their hobbies so this is the drug discovery and development process this is how the pharmaceutical industry or those who practice it in academia it's a complex uh, process that begins with biology and chemistry at the beginning um, chemistry is always present of course in all, all the way then finally when you have drug candidates so you you optimize the properties of your molecule through in vitro testing the biologists do then you go into animals to see if they are toxic or not if they are too toxic then you don't go any further you don't spend any more money in developing then you go once they're safe you go into clinical trials phase one phase two phase three that part is the most expensive process um, it, it costs um, two billion dollars on average to develop one single drug and 93 percent of those who get into the clinic fail only seven percent succeed it's an extremely expensive process basically those statistics are shown here um, you see 1.5 to 2 billion dollars to discover develop a drug 
It takes biologists, chemists, clinicians, among many, to develop. 7% of the drug candidates make it to approval, only 7%. So this costly process can be improved and should be improved. Um, so, so I tell you why we make these poisons and why the pharmaceutical companies are doing that. They, they are using the antibodies that I told you. So the cancer cells, here's a cancer cell. You can see these antennas on the outside of the surface of their membrane. Those are antigens that um, can be used. They're markers, biomarkers, and they're different from normal cells in our bodies. So biologists can develop antibodies against those antigens that become then uh, like a GPS. They can recognize this uh, and, and go and bind to the surface of cancer cells, but they, they ignore the normal cells. So once they bind to the cell, the cell drags them inside like a Trojan horse. Once they go inside, then they can kill the cell if they have a payload on them. The payload is, is like the nuclear weapon, if you wish, that's going to be delivered to these cells. It's like a laser-guided missile carrying a nuclear weapon. So potent they are. So uh, here's the linker, and here is the drug molecules like the ones I show you. So we make these compounds, we give them to our biologists, and they do the rest, and then we go back and forth, and I show you some of these examples. So here's how, for example, calicemycin, uh, it can be uh, attached through a linker into an antibody, and it becomes an antibody to our conjugate, ADC. Here's another one with another payload. That, uh, we made similar compounds like this. We may, we're working with about five or six different classes of these compounds, and there is a lot of excitement these days in many pharmaceutical companies. There's about 50 in clinical trials right now, not from our group. We just began about two years ago, so we don't have clinical trials, but we are on our way to get to that. It's a new paradigm for this so-called targeted cancer therapy. This is another one that's been in the clinic from Genetech. It's called Katsila. It's been approved a few years ago, and it's very, very successful for breast cancer. And this is uh, another molecule that I wanted to tell you, and I, I already told you about this. What's missing is really uh, prepare required building blocks, it's sufficient amounts, couple building blocks, forge remaining two rings, and then maybe you have this one day. But maybe this belongs to the young generation, the young, ambitious students that will take over from this point on. So that is perhaps my final slide, and I want to tell you about. Briefly about my journey, you know, you, you, you heard Professor Schaefer's journey yesterday. Mine is a little briefer, just one slide, but he started in a, a small village in the island of Cyprus. You cannot even see it on the map. It's right here. Those of you who are good in geography, they will know. He said half a million people live there, um, and uh, I was born in a small town by the, by the sea, in a modest beginning. Then I went to Nicosia to a good high school, and I had a mentor. My mentor is this one here, who excited me in chemistry. And he would call me on the blackboard every time to go and solve problems for the class. That gave me confidence. So I realized I was talented in chemistry. At the age of 16, I decided that's what I want to do, and that's what I keep doing today. I haven't changed any direction from that time. So a mentor was very crucial to me. Up from Cyprus, there was no university for me to study anything there. I went to London, where I, I found myself. I had no money. I had basically nobody there. So I had to work for two years to learn the language and also pass my examinations to get into the university. And I, for two years, I was working in fish and chip shops, you know, from there and there, and doing all kinds of jobs in a rubber factory, in a sausage factory, you name it. And then eventually I got a scholarship. I went to the University of London, and I did my bachelor's degree, and then my PhD to University College London. There I had two mentors, a good fortune that worked for Franz Ronheimer, the big boss, and Peter Garrett, who was um, an up-and-coming um, lieutenant of, of him. And I went to work for, for them at the same time as I had the chance to work for Sir Derek Barton, by the way, in the same year. Those chemists would be Sir Derek Barton. And uh, I decided I went to visit them first because they told me, if you get a first-class honors, you can come and work for us. Both B Barton told me that and Franz Zornhammer. And I got my first-class honors. Then I went first to see them, and they mesmerized me. Like the young man last night who put up the show of the mesmerized the audience with his speed uh, painting. 
I was totally mesmerized, so I never went to see Sir Derek Barton. This was 1969. He had no Nobel Prize at the time. So I started working in September 15 in, the, in these laboratories, and three weeks later, Sir Derek Barton won the Nobel Prize. So I started scratching my head whether I did the right thing or not, and that's why I lost my hair. But it, it turned out really that the decision was very crucial for me because I ended up on the right path somehow. So from there, I wrote to E.J. Corey because he was the up-and-coming star at the time. Everybody wanted to work for him. It was Corey and Woodward, rather big shots at the time. So I wrote to Corey. Very quickly, I get an answer. And the answer was the two lines. I have no space in my group for you. So oh, I just pinned it on the wall. And then I consulted with my, my mentor here. And he had worked for somebody at Columbia University by the name of Thomas Katz. Some of you will know. So he said to me, write to him. So I wrote to him. And then he wrote back to me and said, um, um, and I also wrote to Ron Breslow, who is another more famous professor at Columbia. And I got a, a letter from him, and he said to me, I, I don't have the money, unfortunately, from NSF. I don't have it, memory. otherwise I would have left your position. So Breslow offered me a position. And then three months later, I got a letter from Breslow and from Katz. Both they said, I got my money, Katz said, and if you want to work for me, come to me. And Breslow said, if you want to go to Katz, it's OK, either of you. So out of respect for my mentor, who actually got his PhD from Katz, here he is, I chose Katz, even though he was a lesser known professor. So I went to work for him. And then um, in, about a, in about a few months, he asked me if I want to stay and work for him for another year. And I said, no, because my girlfriend at the time would turn to be my wife later, uh, was putting pressure on me to go back to London. She didn't want to come to America. She, her family was there. Um, so I said, not really, no, not unless I have a chance to work for somebody like Woodward or Corey. And so he jumped from his chair. He said, no problem. I know them both. Do you want me to try? I said, OK, just wait until I talk to my girlfriend tonight and tomorrow morning I'll tell you. I went and I lied to her. I said to her, it will be only one year. And then I come, will come back. Uh, so grudgingly, he, she said, OK. So I went the next day and I said, yes, let's try for, for these guys. Within a week, within a week, he was a student of uh, R.B. Woodward. And he also knew Corey at Harvard. He knew them both. So within a week, I got two letters, one from Woodward, one from Corey. And then I had a problem, what, what to do now? Woodward was a Nobel Prize winner at the time. So Katz sent me to see Gilbert Stork. Gilbert Stork was another giant in synthesis. So I went there and I told him why I came and introduced myself. And then I said, um, um, I got two offers one from Woodward and from Corey, and I don't know what to do. And I came to ask for advice. So I kept looking out of the window for five minutes. And I was nervous. And then he turned to me and said, why on, the, why on earth does, do you want to go and work for either of those guys? Uh, I had no idea what to answer him. So I just left, <laughs> put my tail between my legs and left. And in the end, I, I chose the younger man because, he, because I knew that he would give more attention to me and interact with me more. Woodward was a celebrity who spent traveling. And he had a habit not to talk to his students, twice only. When you enter the group, he will accept you. And then when you leave. And that was it. So I chose Corey. And, and Corey won the Nobel Prize later on in 1990. And he's still alive. 88 years old, still having students doing research. And I'm so blessed to, uh, to be able to call myself his student. And he's still, I still talk to him on the phone. He's still as sharp as ever. And he's like my father, you know, my chemical father. And also my, you know, really, truly mentor. So I was lucky to have these mentors um, from Penn. They sent me to Penn first, University of Pennsylvania. Then I went to the Scripps Institute, to do UCSD. I had the laboratory in Singapore. I had a little involvement in China a little bit, but not anymore. And now I am at Rice University, as you can see there. So I travel the world, but I have not forgotten my roots. I still go back to my island to see my friends and my family I have there. And I have, in fact, I became a refugee when 1974, Turkish troops invaded the northern Cyprus, took over my village, expelled all the Greeks, I lost my cousin in the war. I lost my best friend in the war. Um, 
my two sisters, all of us, uh, I wasn't there at the time, but my family ran away uh, to the south of Cyprus. One of my sisters went to Australia. My brother and my sister went to England. And two of my sisters are still in Cyprus, and I am in the United States. So that's the story, and I hope it's um, inspiring for some of the young people because you can do it. Nothing is impossible for you. All you have to do is discover your talent, follow it with passion, and never give up. Have persistence, resourcefulness, creativity, and all will be fine. So I just like in closing to thank again the faculty, the director, uh, all of you. I had a wonderful time here, and um, I will certainly come back if you invite me again, and I enjoy myself enormously. Uh, always. Uh, pleasure to be in, in, in India, to enjoy the culture, the rich culture, uh, and the hospitality of the people. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Now I'd like to request Dr. Y.D. Wankert to present a token of appreciation to Dr. K.C. Nicola. I'm sure you will agree with me that uh, we have heard an extraordinary lecture on a highly uh, exciting sub uh, subject of total synthesis of natural products, of the importance in biology and medicine, not only from the pers uh, historical perspective, but also from the point of view of how the developments have taken place in the group of Professor Nicolau. We hope and expect that Professor Nicola wins the Nobel Prize in near future. <laughs> Once again, please join me in thanking Professor Nicola for an extraordinary lecture, highly inspiring lecture, and highly exciting lecture. Professor Nicola, thank you.